Hello, Year 3s. Today we're going to read Chapter 3 of The Train to Impossible Places, and we'll do it in two parts. This is the first part of Chapter 3. The Impossible Postal Express. The last thing Susie saw before she hit the ground was a train erupting in a whirling mass of wheels, rods and pistons from the tunnel's mouth. Then she screwed her eyes shut, and for a moment the world was dark and full of noise. Hot steam gusted over her face, metal screeched and clashed, a whistle howled. She gritted her teeth and clapped her hands over her ears. The scream of brakes reached a crescendo and suddenly died away. There was a loud outrush of steam, like a sigh of relief, and everything went quiet. Susie risked opening one eye. She had fallen at the foot of Fletcher's tent, her feet just centimetres from the track. Rough hands grasped her shoulders, and she looked up to see Fletch standing over her, pulling her into a sitting position. She was too shocked to resist. What were you thinking? he said, hopping from one foot to another in agitation. You almost became an incident. A what? she said, her ears still ringing. An incident on the line. The worst type of incident it's possible to be. Susie looked at him blankly and wondered what to say. His tone made her want to apologise, but she wasn't sure he deserved it. In fact, didn't he still owe her an apology? She was just gathering her thoughts to say so when a new voice called out from somewhere high above them. Fletch, is that you, old chap? What the dickens is going on down there? They both looked up towards the source of the voice, and Susie almost fell backwards in surprise. A mighty old steam locomotive towered over her, hissing and shuddering and belching yellowish steam from its chimney. It was bigger than any locomotive Susie had seen before. At least, bits of it were. To her eyes, it looked like a large train had smashed into several smaller ones, and maybe a few buildings along the way, and the parts had all got mixed up and stuck together. Its chimney was too wide, none of the drive wheels quite matched, and the cylindrical belly of its boiler was too fat at the front and too narrow at the back. The driver's cab was nothing less than a neat little red brick cottage, complete with tiled roof, window boxes and a bright red front door, which stood open on the near side of the boiler. It was from here that the voice had come, and as Susie watched, a small figure scampered out of the cottage and onto a narrow gangway that ran along the length of the, of the locomotive's flank, a metre or so above the wheels. The figure carried a lantern, and shone the light directly down on Fletch, like a spotlight. Fletch, we didn't just have an incident, did we? Susie tried to make out the figure's face, but it was just a black patch of shadow behind the glare of the lantern. It's worse than that, Stonker, said Fletch. Look. He hooked a thumb in Susie's direction, and the light swung over to cover her. Good grief, a local, and it's awake. Looks like someone on the prep team messed up, said Fletch. Who was on shift tonight? Not a soul, old chap, said Stonker. Didn't you get the memo? They did it all remotely. Puh, Fletch spat. No wonder. Why do I keep, what do I keep telling him? This remote spell business is all well and good, but you need people on the ground if you want to do the job properly. I mean, it's just a sleeping spell. A common tooth fairy could do it. Quite right, old boy, quite right, said Stonker, clearly distracted. But given that it's here, what do you suggest we do with it? We're still behind schedule. Fletch scratched his scalp and looked, at, looked Susie up and down. I should put a call into HQ, I suppose, see if they can send someone to reset her memory. Don't you dare, Susie said, jumping back. You can't go poking around inside my mind. It doesn't belong to you. It's probably for the best, the shadowy figure of the stonker told her. We're not really supposed to be here, you see. Outside our jurisdiction and all that, and it won't do to have you giving us away. Although, having said that, it might take HQ quite a while to get somebody out here. Couldn't you just put a spell on it yourself, Fletch? Fletch sucked his breath in through his teeth. I don't know, Stonks. Memories are fiddly. It's like unknotting spiderwebs. You never know which bit's connected to what. Maybe I could do a confusion spell instead. No, you won't, said Susie, backing away. I'm confused enough as it is. She squinted into the circle of light hiding Stonker. And I'm not an it. I'm a she. Thank you very much. Female of the species, eh? said Stonker. Afraid I'm not really well versed on the fauna in these parts. Do you have a name? 
I'm Susie, said Susie, Susie Smith, and I'd like to know who you are and what you're doing here, please. Well, I suppose we do owe you the courtesy. The light bobbed and weaved as Stonker grappled with the lantern, then it flickered out entirely. It took Susie a few seconds to blink away the red and green smudge it left on her vision, and then she saw him. He was the same sort of creature as Fletch, though his skin was a flinty grey and less warty and wrinkled. He wore a smart blue uniform with a coat that reached his ankles and a peaked cap with silver piping. He looked down at her past both his enormous nose and an equally impressive salt and pepper moustache, as thick and lustrous as a badger, which hung down almost to his knees before the tips curled back up into rigid little spirals. His blue eyes twinkled as he spoke. J.F. Stonker, he said, driver of the Impossible Postal Express, the finest troll train on the rails. He reached up and gave the locomotive's boiler an affectionate pat. You're trolls, she said. How is that possible? We hadn't intended to stop, said Stonker, but I'm afraid you wandered onto the tracks. You're jolly lucky the brakes had just been serviced. That wasn't my fault, said Susie, feeling the temperature rise in her cheeks. The tracks aren't supposed to be here. None of this is supposed to be here, including you. This was all starting to feel terribly unfair. Fear not, said Stonker. We'll be on our way again momentarily, said Fletch. And, and Fletch will have the tracks up and everything back to its normal proportions in no time. You'll never know the difference. Normal proportions? For the first time, Susie realised there was a question that she hadn't asked herself. How could such an enormous steam engine possibly fit inside her house? She looked up past the locomotive and saw the hall ceiling, impossibly high above her head, the purple light shade like a distant hot air balloon. The hall had grown to the size of a cathedral without her even noticing. What happened? she said wide-eyed. What did you do? Not really my department, I'm afraid, said Stonker. Fletch is a technical genius. Fletch sniffed. I try my best. Susie hardly heard them. She was running back and forth, trying to take it all in. The living room door was as tall as a cliff now, and she would have to stand on tiptoes if she wanted to reach the top of the skirting board. The kitchen door had vanished altogether, replaced by another enormous stone arch. The tracks didn't end there anymore, but ran into the blank darkness beyond. Her voice echoed in the cavernous space as she cried, You shrank us! Nah! said Fletch, cocking his head to one side and plucking at the hairs in his ears. I just gave the hall a bit of a stretch, that's all. You mean you made everything bigger? Susie gaped at him, horrified. That's worse. How big is the house now? It must be, it must take up half the street. What sort of fly-by-night merchant do you take me for? said Fletch. I didn't make the outside any bigger. I haven't touched any of the other rooms. What would be the point of that? Wait a minute. Susie fought to digest this new information. You mean the house is still its normal size, even though you've made the hall bigger than the house. That's right, Fletch grinned, warming to his topic. It's pretty standard stuff, really. Your basic metadimensional engineering, a dash of magic and a few bits of double-sided sticky tape. Job done. Susie looked again at the living room doorway. She could see her parents beyond it fast asleep and normal sized, but the doorway itself seemed to flicker and stretch when she focused on it. It only took her a few seconds to realise that she was seeing it as both sizes at the same time. But by then it had started to make her feel seasick and she had to look away. No, she said, shaking her head. I'm sorry, but that's impossible. Is it? said Fletch, feigning surprise. You can't just make something bigger on the ins inside than the outside. Of course you can. It's simple physics. Susie frowned. You mean physics? No, said Fletch. Physics. It's like physics, only fuzzier. Physics can't be fuzzy, said Susie, indignant that something so precious to her should be treated like a bit of a joke. It's either right or wrong. It won't let you break the rules. Well, that's why physics kind of saunters past him, said Fletch. It's easier than doing everything by the book. He gave her an infuriating grin, and she was drawing her and she was drawing breath to argue her case further when Stonk had cleared his throat. This is all jolly nice, he said, twirling the end of his moustache around his fingers, but I'm afraid we really must be leaving. We, we are really late, and I'm going to get underway before... Mr. Stonker, Mr. Stonker, the voice came, came from the direction of the carriages. Too late, sighed Stonker, pinching the bridge of his enormous nose. Here he comes. 
So that is the end of part one. I'll see you back here for part two, chapter three.